just about out of it. Wet. Moist. Just being in here. Just, I guess. Anyway, the... Uh, It's a quite a uh, a problem," he said. He's been all over this summer. A lot of them they pick up the frisk from the air. He suggested instead of opening the wrapper up, we just cut the ends off and pull the paper out as we need it, and not to put too much delay there in the machine. Uh, I still don't understand how, you know, because we would rerunning. Can we run half of uh, the book and then it would peter out? I really don't know why that would do it if that's the case but as far as I'm concerned uh, I just I mean I leave it with he knows his stuff I do not and um, uh, therefore I do not have much more to say about it if, huh he came yeah he came and went over the machine and gave it the old uh, once over that boy knows his stuff he's really very very good he really is a very humble young fella I should have asked him to look at my typewriter I bet he I bet he could have fixed I the problem I'm facing is my my hyphens and my commas and periods are not typing uh, every time sometimes they do sometimes they don't when when uh, when Scotty starts to go over this book, he's he's gonna he's gonna find a lot of them that need to be put in. What is that? <laughs> Mine has a memory, good memory. Okay, well. Uh, we're studying in uh, Acts, the book of Acts, and uh, um, we are in, well, but I want you to turn to Galatians chapter 4. We're going to get back to Acts in a moment, but I want you to look, open your Bible to Galatians chapter 4. Every believer is a priest, and every believer priest has the privilege of personally and privately preparing himself for the study of the Word of God using rebound if necessary, bringing every thought into captivity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Once again, loving Father, we are grateful for the privilege and the honor of studying the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit take the things which we look at and make them a source of blessing, challenge, and encouragement, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we get back to our study, I uh, just want to make available to our listening audience and our television audience the book called The Doctrine of the Church. It's it designed to be a, an appendix in the exegesis of Galatians chapter 1, but because that will be a while before it's out, this book is available right now and is a very, very important volume, The Doctrine of the Church, and it deals with some things that you should know. Every believer needs to know the ten characteristics of the church age, the ten things that make the church age different and unique. And I'm not going to be able to mention it again. This will be the last time we'll mention it on uh, uh, television. So it's free. There's no charge. Just write and ask for the doctrine of the church, and we'll send it out to you. But I just encourage you to get your copy. Now, in Galatians chapter 4, we find the reason that the Apostle Paul stopped when he came on his first missionary journey. We have been looking at Galatians chapter 1, verse 2, where he says to the churches of Galatia, 
We spent some time in our last class studying the isagogics around Paul's entering into Pisidian Antioch in this area. And the key is found in the fourth chapter of uh, Galatians uh, because in uh, Galatians 4.15, Paul tells them something. But we have to go back and get the, the... I want you to see the attitude in that place beginning in verse 8. Galatians 4.8. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable principles? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. Verse 12, I plead with you, brothers, become like me, for I became like you. You have done me no wrong. It was a personal thing. As you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. Even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus himself. What has happened to all your joy? I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. So we see that it was because of illness that he, the illness we talked about, he picked up this eye disease in Pamphylia and stopped here at Pisidian Antioch. And it was because of the eye disease that he was there. And they loved him when he... They loved him when he first came to them. They were willing to, 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 if it were possible, to take their eyes and give them to him so that he might carry on the gospel. But, of course, uh, things didn't work out that way. Now back to Acts chapter 13, where we have been looking at what took place uh, when Paul entered into the synagogue uh, there in... Uh, Pisidian Antioch. In Acts chapter 13, we noted that uh, in verse 44, that the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy, talked abusively against what Paul was saying. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, We had to speak the word of God to you first, since you rejected it, and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we turn now to the Gentiles, for this is what the Lord has commanded us. And then he quotes from Habakkuk and again from uh, Isaiah. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Obviously, uh, uh, in verse 48, uh, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad, they honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. I want to look at that word, appointed, for eternal life, because a lot of people do not understand that. They look at terms of predestination in the wrong sense. The word which is translated here, appointed, is the perfect participle from the word tasso in the Greek. T-A-S-S-O. Now, tasso means to set or put in order things or plans which would otherwise be indefinite or uncertain. And the perfect tense simply indicates that in eternity past, the uh, uh, perfect tense in the doctrine of divine decrees, God predetermined that the gospel should go to the Gentiles so that the Gentiles could be joint heirs with the Jews who become believers in the new organism called uh, the church, and that they should become heirs of eternal life 
the same way that every other one would, and that would those who were appointed to eternal life believed. Now, this doesn't mean that God predetermined that some would be saved or predetermined that some would be lost. He simply, in eternity past, in the doctrine of divine decrees, fed into the computer called the plan of God all of those who would go positive toward the gospel that was preached and those who were the, who came out were those he foreknew would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and they are the ones who are, are referred to here. And then we note that uh, verse 49, the word of God spread throughout the whole region. And once these people got saved and uh, they started to spread the word and uh, you'll notice uh, the Jews in the city incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city they stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region now uh, apparently uh, uh, women en en enjoyed considerable prestige and civic offices here and uh, God-fearing, though not believers, indicating that they were religious people. And this uh, would tell us that uh, the Jewish leaders used all of their power and influence to antagonize uh, the leadership of the city uh, against Paul and Barnabas. And when it says they shook the dust from their feet, it is an evident, it's an idiom for turning them over to the judgment of God for discipline. Now they're going to move in the area. They're going to move to three larger cities. And you'll notice Iconium is listed here, Lystra, and Derby. These three cities are uh, uh, located in the area. Okay, uh, from uh, Iconium, chapter 14, 1 to 6. Lystra is found in 14, 7 to 20a. And Derby, uh, chapter 14, verses 20b and 21a. In all three of these cities, there was a positive response to the gospel, therefore laying a foundation for uh, churches. Once again, the Jews continued their relentless persecution, and uh, uh, in Lystra, we have the story of the Apostle Paul uh, 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 approached those who were not Jews with the gospel. He turns from their cultic gods to the true God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, rather than talking to Jews, in verse 17 of chapter 14, you'll notice how he uh, weaves it in. Uh, he says, In the past, he let all nations go their own way, yet he has not left himself without a testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven, crops in their seasons, which is what? The, the message is grace, isn't it? He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Uh, uh, when this happens, they begin to uh, worship him again, just as they had previously. Uh, they had uh, thought, uh, they, they called uh, Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes in verses 12 and 13 while uh, they were in uh, uh, Lystra and Derby. So uh, Paul had, uh, they were treated actually all like gods. And I bring that out only because uh, it's amazing how easy it is to sway emotional people. Those who are uh, were a short time before uh, are, call, are, are worshiping him, uh, uh, these two men as gods, uh, are, uh, going, are, are so soon removed from the gospel uh, and have, having become the enemy, uh, their enemy. But then uh, wasn't it uh, the same crowd that shouted, Hosanna on uh, uh, the uh, uh, when the Lord Jesus Christ entered the city that a few days later cried crucify him and so uh, it's not unusual for people to be the same way you, uh, the the man of God must not entrust himself to people because people are fickle you cannot trust people's emotions and the person that pats you on the back today and says you are the best Bible teacher I've ever heard, will tomorrow have a knife in his hand uh, if you offend something that is precious or special to him. But uh, having completed their ministry, they returned to the churches, 
and now head back for Jerusalem. So having traveled over 700 miles by land and 500 miles by sea, and this is without benefit of motors and uh, planes and uh, things like that, Paul and Barnabas saw the grace of God at work. However, it wasn't long before uh, trouble arises in paradise. And Paul has to write uh, to the Galatians uh, in Galatians 1.6, I am astonished that you are so soon removed from the gospel uh, according to the, the, of the gospel of the grace of God to another gospel. And it's, 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 it's really a very serious matter because, beloved, uh, we find it's true throughout all of history. In Acts chapter 20, he tells the Ephesian pastors, keep watch over yourselves and the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you the overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he brought with his, bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, Savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after themselves. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. I guess we must always remember to keep watch over yourselves because the attack sometimes comes from wolves in sheep's clothing from without. Sometimes it's from people who are within. But we have already noted J. Vernon McGee's uh, uh, statements about the degeneration of the church uh, into Disneyland doctrine, tinker toy theology, Hollywood holiness, lollipop liberalism, a mirage of miracles, psychological Christianity being substituted for Christian living, the gospel of self-esteem, uh, uh, conflicting with the statements of our Lord who came into the world to save sinners. Satan using Eastern religion to gain a foothold in the churches. Environment worshipped. Organizations rising up which are using high pressure methods for raising money. And although I disagree with John MacArthur on the subject of Lordship Salvation, as set forth in his book, The Gospel According to Jesus. I must agree with his conclusions in his newest book called Charismatic Chaos. In this volume, MacArthur sounds the warning regarding the fluff of emotional experience which has replaced the substance of sound doctrine both in bookstores and in the local church. He says, experience is not the test of biblical truth. Rather, biblical truth stands in final judgment on experience. He goes on to state that he is convinced that the fundamental teachings of the charismatic movement create an extreme emphasis on external evidences and therefore thereby encourage bogus claims, false prophets, and other forms of spiritual humbug. These result in deviations from the norm and standard of orthodoxy however slight, which grow to heretical proportions. And then he says, that is my point. The worst extremes usually start with slight deviations. There is no such thing as a slight deviation from truth. Continuing that quote, the entire charismatic movement has absorbed the erroneous notion that whatever is truly spiritual must transcend or bypass people's rational sense. He explains that the truly spiritual person is not someone who's swept away into trances, ecstatics, and emotional frenzies. When a person is out of control, it's never because of the Holy Spirit. Those who claim to have been slain, by the, slain in the Spirit may indeed have been slain, but it is not by the Holy Spirit. He condemns that the men are little gods doctrine of several televangelists and rightly false other proponents of the health and wealth or name it and claim it hucksterism. He then concludes by stating the only appropriate reason response is and always has been a return to the word. So whatever the deviation is from doctrine, however slight, it must be dealt with and dealt with swiftly and decisively. That's the reason that the Apostle Paul wades in with both feet 
in the uh, letter to the Galatians to root out the gospel of a different kind, which has not only been proclaimed by these false teachers, but has actually been accepted by the congregation. Uh, remember, uh, John wrote in, in uh, 1 John chapter 4, he says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they be of God or not. And that is the key. And uh, so we move on to the next verse uh, in Galatians chapter 1, verse 3, which says, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, which opens to us the next subject matter, which we are going to look at in great detail, and that is the doctrine of the grace of God. And so, again, we have another volume to offer to you, and that is Grace, God's Middle Name. That's my subtitle, but it is available to you, and uh, we make it available without charge. Simply write and ask for the book on Grace. It was an interesting thing. Uh, I was at a pastor's conference. Uh, I told you, you only go to the ones where they give free books away. And this was a pastors and publishers meeting. And one of the free books that was given, and the uh, man who, who was there gave a brief message, uh, passed this book out. And um, um, I, I, it's a very interesting book. It's done in uh, a uh, devotional type uh, setting wherein it's a page and a half uh, straight through, you know, just a page and a half on each one. Uh, and uh, he's got some tremendous uh, principles. He really does uh, an excellent job. Uh, however, I have to write him a note because, unfortunately, he has made a, a, a grievous mistake, uh, and when it comes to the subject of repentance, it's a matter of uh, uh, not understanding the truth. But I thought, uh, by way of contrast, I just want to, uh, to show you something. In his acknowledgments, he acknowledges... Uh, these books, James Stewart's book, A Man in Christ, and Watchman Nee's The Normal Christian Life, uh, as uh, having an, uh, an influence on uh, his ministry. Well, I hadn't seen that book when I had already written the preface to our this new book, entitled Grace. Why? Have I put? Uh, uh, why am I doing another book on grace? Well, I say in, in the book that I am uh, drawing from years of reading, note taking, without noting the source. And uh, however, I want no credit for what's uh, contained in the book. Uh, I am not an original thinker. I want you to understand that. I, I realize I'm not an original thinker. That's the reason that I surround myself with a library of sound. Uh, theological books on the subject. I don't waste my time reading a whole lot of controversial material that's not in line with the way I believe. I do check it out to make sure that they're not right, uh, 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 but I do uh, uh, spend my time reading what counts. But rather than uh, make a mistake, uh, you know, and uh, uh, not quote the right person, I decided at the beginning to list some of the books which have made an influence and will be quoted from uh, uh, th throughout the book on grace. And these include uh, Jerry Bridges' book called Transforming Grace, put out by Nav Press. Louis, Louis Berry Schaefer's book on grace, published by Dunham. Uh, Dr. M. R. D. Hahn's book, Law or Grace, published by Zondervan. Zane Hodges has three books that had a great impact uh, one is entitled Grace in Eclipse, published in 1985, The Gospel Under Siege, published in 1981, and Absolutely Free, 
which is his newest book published in 1989. Uh, Alva McLean, the uh, former head of, uh, of uh, Grace Seminary, wrote a book, Law and Grace, which is out of print today, but it's a fantastic book. Uh, and it's uh, out, uh, published in 1954, but it's tremendous contrast between law and grace. Uh, Charles Ryrie has three outstanding books. In 1969, he wrote Balancing the Christian Life. In 1963, he wrote the book on the, the, entitled The Grace of God, an outstanding volume. And then in 89, So Great Salvation. Uh, John Schmidt did a book in 1940 put out by the American Tract Society, which I've had in my library for all these years. And it's in simply entitled The Riches of His Grace, one of the most fantastic books which has ever been printed. And then Doc, Charles Swindoll's The Grace Awakening, put out by Word, and then R.B. Theme Jr., many tapes and, and notebooks uh, and books. But uh, I I'm, I'm have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve books plus the tapes as opposed to two books, and this gets published on a national pu publication. Now, my books can't be published nationally simply because I will not allow them to be sold. I cannot place a price tag on what God has given to me. Therefore, I cannot allow anything that I have written to be sold for a price. And nobody's going to publish them except us without charge. Now, in addition to those, you will hear me quoting from a number of other sources throughout this study because uh, there will be a number of uh, uh, words of exegesis. There will be all kinds of uh, uh, other references in addition to the simply uh, the, uh, the books on grace. But it's time for us to begin to look at the doctrine of the grace of God. There are hundreds of religious organizations. There are hundreds of religious groups. But there are actually just two religions. No matter how you slice it, there are two and only two. From Islam, Shintoism, Hinduism, Judaism, every kind of cult you can think of, every weird concoction, mixtures from the traditional to the occult, yet there are only two religions. And one says, something in my hand I bring. The other says, nothing in my hand I bring. And everything can be broken down into those two. I just uh, received a, uh, a book in the mail done by George Barna, who is... Uh, the Christian um, uh, 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 the one who is comparable to George Gallup. That is, he, he spends his whole life uh, and his organization taking surveys uh, among Christians. And uh, he has published a number of books. Uh, the book that I uh, received has to do with a report on uh, his uh, organization discovering what it is like in the United States of America, religion in America, what, the, what they believe. And they do it by uh, simply automatically dialing certain telephones without looking in phone books to find out who they are. These computers select at random and calls, and they make the, their calls that way, and they make their discernment. But the amazing thing that I read uh, just recently in that book is that though... Though uh, these people are saved, 86% of believers in the United States of America believe that they are saved by grace plus something else. 86% of the Christians in the United States think that they're saved by the grace of God plus the addition of something else. And I would venture to say that if they had asked the question about those who think that they are saved by grace, but who must, after they are saved by grace, must somehow do something in order to uh, merit uh, the blessing of God uh, would be even higher than that. I would venture to say that perhaps even 96 to 98 percent of believers in the United States of America think that performance has something to do 
with whether or not you are accepted by God after you're saved, whether you are blessed by God after you're saved. And therefore they know nothing about the grace of God. And uh, I know, uh, you know how it, how it is. Uh, if you are, uh, uh, we know that uh, one of our people is undergoing surgery in the morning. Uh, you, know what the, you know what the thinking would be? I better make sure that everything is really spiritual tonight in case something happens in the morning. Because, you know, otherwise, let me tell you something, that's not grace. Grace, doesn't, grace says it doesn't make any difference what you are like. God's not going to get you through that surgery or bless you because of what you are doing, because of a performance, because of whether you're spiritual or unspiritual, closer to God or farther from God. It's not going to have a bit of difference on that. And yet we all think that way. If you have a, speci a real specifically difficult time that you're facing, the first thing you do is to want to make sure, gee, I wonder if everything, am I rebounded up? You know, I mean, uh, we want to think right away of, uh, uh, am, I, uh, am I deserving of blessing? That's the way you think. We're, we're, we live in that kind of a society. We want to think, well, yeah, boy, does, uh, you know, now I'm going to, I'm applying for a new job. Uh, I wonder, I better make sure, uh, this is the week I won't, uh, I'll, I'll give up smoking this week so that I can deserve God's blessing, see? Or I'll, uh, uh, I, uh, this is the week I'm going to uh, uh, have no impure thoughts. Uh, uh, this is the week I'm going to not say one cuss word. Uh, this is one week I'm never going to feel sorry for myself. I'm going to check up on all my sins. I'm going to make sure that I've gotten rid of all those little nasty sins so that uh, uh, God will bless me and get me that job or do this or do that for me, you see. But uh, we live surrounded by the concept of performance, performance, performance. Everything is on the basis of performance except with God. Nothing can be farther from God's heart than a person who thinks that he can earn or deserve not only salvation, beloved. You're squared away on that. I know that. But there's nothing you'll ever earn from God. There's nothing you'll ever deserve from God. You and I don't get things from God because of who and what we are. We get it from God because of who and what He is. But these people who come thinking something in my hand I bring are, are well-intentioned people. They have good motives. They simply uh, uh, seek to impress God with their sincere attempts to show to Him that they are worthy of recipients of what he can do for them and whether it's the mechanized prayer wheel in Tibet the uh, Hindu lying on the bed of spikes to show God how pious he is or those who walk through the flames or the uh, the hot coals to demonstrate their spirituality or the righteousness of the Pharisee that says, I thank you that I am not like that publican. I fast, I pray, I give, and so forth. From the uh, Confucianist who patterns his life according to the moral precepts of China's great leader to the strict renunciation of every earthly desire uh, by which means Buddha taught his followers to attain to nirvana. From the Arab who obeys the five demands of Islam, that is the repetition of the Muslim creed, observing stated times of prayer, fasting, almsgiving, and pilgrimages to Mecca, in order that he might gain entrance into the paradise the Muhammad promised to the faithful. To the so-called Christian who thinks in his arrogance and idiocy that his church attendance, his giving, his service, or other good deeds can earn either heaven or blessing. 
All of these are coverings from which the religion of works has proceeded from age to age, from nation to nation, from culture to culture. But it's all the same. Man must perform certain meritorious acts which will cause the God of the universe to accept him and by so doing he may earn his passage to his eternal home. And we say, well, it's too bad. That's what organized religion is like. But you know, only about half of the people in the United States go to church of any kind. 46%, as a matter of fact, according to George Barna's uh, statistics. 46%, which means that there, that 54% uh, of the people in the United States don't go to church. You know what they're thinking? Uh, most of them will say, no, I don't go to church, but look, I live a pretty decent life. Isn't that right? I mean, look, I'm good to my family. I, I don't cheat in business. I'm a respectable citizen. So, well, all in all, I'm as good as, if not better, than some of the church people that you know, aren't I? Now, that may rank awfully low compared to the uh, Hindu laying on the bed of spikes, but it's a form of religion, isn't it? It's a non-religion religion, which is, again, trusting in the fact that he's not so bad that's uh, going to get him into heaven. But it's still something in my hand I bring, and my, the something is my own goodness. You know, if there were a society which were made up of people who are religious people like that we've talked about, it might not be a bad place to live. I mean, churches would be filled on Sunday, no need for police or jails, the moral level of the community would be the highest, since everyone would tithe, the treasuries of the churches would be full to overflowing, with more than enough to meet the needs of the poor. Uh, what more could you ask for? What better society could there be, huh? Nevertheless, beloved, it would still be an earned salvation. And such a, as, as such, it would be an, the antithesis to Christianity, which simply says, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Perhaps there's an even more insidious approach, which is the attempt to mix the two. The logical argument is that it is just too simple to believe that God has done everything necessary to save sinful man. That's too good to be true. Certainly man must contribute something. Consequently, they piece together a religious system that adds works plus grace and adds up to the work of man added to the finished work of Christ. And if something is finished, you can't add anything to it. Andrew Bonar has written a hymn that's not in our hymnal. have to go all the way back to some of the ancient hymnals, and I have a few of those around. And it says this, Not what these hands have done can save this guilty soul. Not what this toiling flesh has borne can make this spirit whole. Not what I feel or do can give me peace with God. Not all my prayers and sighs and tears can bear my awful load. Thy work alone, O Christ, can ease this weight of sin. Thy blood alone, O Lamb of God, can give me peace within. Thy grace alone, O God, to me can pardon speak. Thy power alone, O Son of God, can this sore bondage break. Now, the Bible message is not what we've done for God, but what God has done for us. And so we're going to study the, de the doctrine of grace, and we begin with a definition and an explanation. And the first thing we need to understand are seven propositions about grace. 
One, God exists. Well, we're not here to prove it. We accept it. Two, this God that exists has revealed himself. He's not an unknowable God, but he has revealed himself in a canon, a completed scripture. Three, this God who exists and has revealed himself has a plan for dealing with the human race. Four, this plan is entirely based upon a policy, and that policy is God's grace. This grace is divided into categories. We'll take a clean sheet for number five, sub five. These are the categories of grace. And these are the way we will study this doctrine. And this is why I have written the book, to put it into the form that is in a position for people to study it. First we have what we call pre-salvation grace. Pre-salvation grace has two subdivisions. One is called common grace and the other is called calling grace or inviting grace. Then we have saving grace. And saving grace has two divisions. One is called efficacious grace. And the other are the 40 blessings which come from grace at the point of salvation. Thirdly, we have living grace. And living grace is divided into three categories. Logistical grace, disciplining grace, and super grace. Then there is dying grace. And fifthly, grace in eternity, which also has two divisions. One is called uh, surpassing grace. and the other rewarding grace. That's, this is just the fifth proposition, that the grace of God is divided into categories. You should know each of these because each of these is vitally essential to your executing the plan of God here on the earth and by the time we're finished you should know it and it'll be in written form in, a, in an order that is not found anywhere there is no systematic theology that lists them and categor categorically goes through them in this order which is the only excuse I have for being for writing the book the sixth proposition regarding grace is that since the believer is saved by grace he must live by grace. God is consistent. There is no legalism in salvation. Therefore, there is no legalism in the Christian way of life. And seven, under the divine policy of grace, all of our blessings come from God 
on the basis of grace and grace alone. Now under this, a few sub-points to understand what I'm saying. Under the principle of free will and volition, all failure in the life comes from ourselves, from the principle of the law of volitional responsibility, which means that we must assume responsibility for all of our bad decisions. Now, let me say something about failure. Everybody fails God sometime or another. There is nobody who has not failed God except our Lord and Savior Himself. The great Apostle Paul failed God three times in his lifetime that are recorded in Scripture, and every time it was in the area of grace that he failed God. The great apostle of grace failed in the area in which he was supposed to be the strongest, the area of grace. We have all failed. So long as we are still alive, we get up and move on by means of his grace. So you have failed. So what? The grace of God says that doesn't make a bit of difference. Just be smart enough, folks, to learn from your mistake. Learn from your failure. As someone talking to Thomas Edison said, he said now if you go down into Florida, down into Fort Myers, you will visit one of the uh, uh, unique places. Before the railroad even went down there, Thomas Edison uh, uh, built a summer home and a, a laboratory. And he, because of the beautiful growing facility there, he imported from all over the world every exotic pot plant that he could find, from which source he sought to find a filament for his light bulb. And he, uh, he was convinced that bamboo was the one of the better filaments and so there in this uh, botanical garden surrounding his home down there there are hundreds of bamboo plants from every continent every place where bamboo is grown and all the exotic plants uh, in fact some of them are are poisonous they tell you tell your children not to touch these because they could be poisonous they were here because uh, they're they were brought in by mr. Edison and someone asked Thomas Edison what he has learned from the fact that he has used 3,000 different uh, uh, pieces of uh, uh, plants and uh, uh, things for the filament on his light bulb. Okay? And, and he said, I have learned that there are 3,000 things that won't work. Okay? It's all right to fail. You can fail. When, you know, we all have failed. Okay? If you learn from it, that it, it's the stupid way to go. It's smart, but uh, he has he has learned, and he does have. They have burning down in the in their uh, laboratory. The filament made out of uh, one form of bamboo that has been burning ever since the time of Edison, early 1900. They never shut it off. Only one bulb is burned out in the whole place. Now, needless to say, it doesn't give anything like the light. It's here. The light of one of those light bulbs would be comparable perhaps to maybe a candle or two. It isn't very bright, but it burns. It's amazing. It's real thick, you know, about the thickness of a rubber band, the, the filament. And it just, they get, the electricity goes through it and it glows and it just keeps on glowing. It's amazing. I'd have thought it would have turned ashes. But the point is, we do fail. We fail because we make bad decisions. We make bad decisions because we make decisions apart from Bible doctrine. But the point is this. Whenever we fail, remember it's not God's fault. But God uses our failures to build into us in that which will cause us success in the future. But God's grace means that we'll never earn or deserve one blessing from God. 
Not one, beloved. There's, well, there will never be anything that you ever get from God because of what you do, because God has done everything already. All we have ever earned from God is judgment and condemnation. But because of who and what He is, His grace is greater than our failures. His grace is greater than our flaws. His grace is greater than our sins. His grace is greater than our self-righteous legalism. His grace is greater than our human good and our own worthless dead works. His grace is the, the, the solution to life. And that's what we're going to be studying. We're going to study so much more about grace than we ever thought there was uh, written. But grace is so, much, is so fantastic, so thrilling, so exciting, so wonderful, that it has made provision for absolutely everything that we are, everything that we will ever become, everything that we will ever have comes from the source of who and what God is. And we aren't going to earn it by a good life. We aren't going to earn it by towing the line. We aren't going to earn it by uh, making sure. Now, this doesn't say go out and sin, you know. That's what, uh, that's what the, 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 uh, Paul says in Romans. Because the grace, where, where sin abounds, grace much more abounds, does that mean we should all go out and, and sin? He says, absolutely not. How shall we who are dead to sin live any longer in the sphere of the old sin nature. And he goes on to point that out. And uh, the grace of God hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously in this world, says the Paul when he writes to young Pastor Titus. Grace is not licensed to sin. Grace is the freedom to be all that God has for us to be. So that we're not working on performance, but we're relaxing in who and what God is. And beloved, it's the, it's the only life that is worth living because it doesn't depend on a man who is frail and weak and sinful it only depends on a God who is absolutely, completely reliable. Now, thank you, Heavenly Father, for this study. May God, the Holy Spirit, help us to center our thinking on this glorious theme, the grace of God. In Jesus' name, amen.